As we continue our worship of the living God through the reading of his word, I invite you to open your Bibles to the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 4, verse 1 through verse 25. Romans 4, verse 1 through verse 25. May the Lord give us all eyes to see and ears to hear this morning. Romans chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are credited as a gift, are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe, but not, have not been circumcised, in order that the righteousness, the righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend upon the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, 
for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Well, good morning, church family. Let me extend also my uh, happy Mother's Day to you moms here or to you watching online this morning. I know I plan to call my mom this afternoon. That's on my to-do list. It's a good thing to do today. But that also means that we are just a couple of weeks away from Memorial Day weekend. May is halfway through here. We're almost Uh, We're two weeks away from Memorial Day weekend. And that also means that a number of our students are going to be returning to or maybe even starting a a new summer job. I want you to think back to maybe back in those days as a teen, maybe when you got your first summer job or your first job, and uh, you remember that. You remember getting that, that first paycheck. Think back to those days. Maybe did you babysit or did you mow lawns? Uh, did you work in a retail store or in, in a restaurant? Uh, maybe you were one of those lucky enough for a summer job that you got to work outdoors for the whole summer. My first job uh, back in those days was at our local supermarket, bagging groceries, gathering up all the shopping carts out on the parking lot. And things have changed over the years. Back when I was working at the the grocery store, we used to have to wear the button-down shirt and a tie. didn't matter how hot it was. And... uh, you still bag groceries, still grab those carts off the, off the lot. But I was glad to have that job because I was earning $3.80 an hour and I could save that spending money and I could go out that summer and, and buy CDs or go with my friends to the movies over the weekend. Every other Friday I would receive a, a paycheck And I could take that to the bank, and I could put that into my account, and and I knew that was my money. I knew that I had earned it, and that I could spend that money on whatever I wanted. Well, I want you to keep that idea of a paycheck in mind here as we return now to Romans chapter 4. In fact, the opening illustration in Romans 4, uh, the Apostle Paul uses here, uh, there in verse 4, he says this, he says, Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. Now this principle should make sense to us. Anybody that's ever received a paycheck, this should, this should make sense If you work your, say, 40-hour work week, your employer owes you your your wages for that pay period. The money that you receive is not a reward for a job well done. It's not a gift from your boss. When you earn a paycheck, it is your money. You earned it. But Romans 4 really isn't a chapter about paychecks or wages. However, in this passage, what the Apostle Paul is doing is he's borrowing language from the financial world in order to help us check the balance of our spiritual account before God. You see, in God's economy, on our balance sheets, These things are tallied not in in dollar amounts, but as an accounting of our righteousness. In other words, the question we need to ask ourselves is, does the ledger of our righteousness, does it show a sufficient enough balance to indicate a right standing before a holy God? 
Now, if you've been with us through this journey through the book of Romans so far, you know that the answer to that question is absolutely not. You see, at best, we have a zero balance. Our accounts are completely empty of anything good. At least that's what we learned from Romans chapters 1 through 3. In fact, you might remember from a few Sundays ago when we took that honest look at our spiritual ledgers. According to Romans 3, Paul quoting from the Old Testament said, There is no one righteous, not even one. Now, what's worse is, as we start to balance the books, we not only discover that there's no righteousness in those accounts, when we take a closer look, it actually reveals that our account is overdrawn, that we are so deeply in debt. Two Sundays ago, we came across one of these key mile markers along the Romans road. It's a verse that maybe many of you have memorized at one time. Romans 3.23, which says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, it may seem like it as we went through Romans chapter 1 through 3, but, but fortunately, Paul's letter to the Romans isn't all doom and gloom. There is good news in this letter. And the good news of the gospel is that God has done something to bring those accounts back into order. He's not only mercifully made a way to cancel our sin debt, but he's also graciously made a way for us to be, for us to be declared righteous in his sight. I want to remind you of the good news that we read about back in Romans 3, 21 to 24, where Paul said, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So a couple of Sundays ago when we finished up Romans chapter 3, we came across a very significant theological term. Do you remember this term? It was in our passage this morning, justification. It's popped up a few times in Romans 3, and I promise you it will continue to pop up throughout the letter of Romans. But this concept of justification, it is integrally linked to the message of the gospel. In fact, some people might even argue that it is the main idea of Paul's letter to the Romans. Now, justification as a concept, it actually showed up the first time back in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, where Paul said, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Now, what's going on there, I think this is where the NIV does a great job in translating, in fleshing out the meaning of this unfamiliar term justification. It actually translates that word and it it translates it as declared righteous. Or maybe you have the New Living Translation, which makes that meaning even more clear, translating that word justification as made right with God. You might be thinking, well, what does this very long introduction and review have to do with the passage here in Romans 4? Well, this morning I'm picking up right where Pastor Jerry left off last Sunday as we consider together this Old Testament hero named Abraham. But is it right to call Abraham a a hero of the Bible? I thought about that, and then I thought, well, you know, nearly four billion Christians, Jews, and even Muslims 
would consider Abraham to be a hero. Anyone that came from a Jewish background living in Paul's day would have considered Abraham to be sort of a biblical hall of famer. And in fact, that's exactly the reason why Abraham is the main character here in Romans chapter 4. Because in order to demonstrate this concept that no one is right before God because of their works... And the justification by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, in order to show this, Paul wants his readers to take this very good look at Abraham's spiritual bank balance. Because Paul's Jewish audience would have thought something like this. Surely, if anyone in the Bible could show us a a ledger that was just loaded with works of righteousness to their credit. It would have to be Father Abraham. But then we ask the question, well, what does the Old Testament Scriptures, what do the Old Testament Scriptures actually teach? What does the Bible actually say about why Abraham could be considered to be one who had a right relationship with God? Well, an answer is here in Romans 4, chapter 3. Look with me at the Scriptures. Romans 4, 3 says, what does Scripture say? What does the Old Testament say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, if you were with us last Sunday, Pastor Jerry walked us through some key moments in Abraham's story from the book of Genesis as those points in his story relate to Paul's message here in Romans 4. And what we discovered together was that Abraham was a man of genuine faith. Abraham was a man who was completely convinced that God keeps his promises. Abraham was a man whose hope rested securely on the supernatural, miracle-working power of God when there was no way forward possible. In a nutshell, as Paul says right there in verse 3, Abraham believed God. We might summarize that entire message of Romans 14, uh, 4, 13 to 22, sort of the middle of this chapter. We might summarize that section by saying that against all hope, Abraham demonstrated an unwavering faith in the power of God to fulfill all that God had promised. I liked how Pastor Jerry said it last Sunday. Abraham believed that God had the power to do all that God promised to do. But the point of Romans 4 here is is so much more than that Abraham was this great man of faith. I want you to look again with me at that key verse here in verse 3. Romans 4 verse 3 which says, Abraham believed God, and it goes on, and it says, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's what we're considering this morning. Why was Abraham declared to be righteous? Why was it that he was considered to be in a right relationship with God? What we're told is that Abraham was, was counted righteous, or credited, it was credited to him as righteousness. He was counted righteous in God's eyes, Because he believed God. Abraham was justified by faith alone. So this morning we're going to take another look at Abraham's faith. Having considered last Sunday the story of Abraham's faith as described in Genesis, today we want to think more about the nature of Abraham's faith. Faith. And in particular, what does having faith like Abraham look like for Christians who are living today? Hope you still have even that, that picture of that first job in mind, that first uh, 
paycheck or the paycheck you receive today because we're going to keep looking again at this concept. Romans 4 verse 4 and the verses there that follow. The first part of this passage, Romans 4, 4 through 8, we see that faith like Abraham's earns us nothing, but it gains us everything. That's what Paul's trying to establish in the first part of this chapter. Faith like Abraham's earns us nothing, but it gains us everything. Now, the basic principle that Paul establishes in verse 4 is again that no one could ever con uh, confuse receiving a gift with receiving a wage. The worker earns a wage, but a gift is freely received. Another way to think of this is at the end of this month, here when, when some of our high school graduates, they start to get those cards in the mail with a little bit of cash or a check. As they open those up, they're, uh, they will understand, hopefully, that they're receiving a gift. That they're not receiving some kind of wage for four years worth of work in high school. Again, the same is true in God's economy. Since it was established back in Romans 3.20, that no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law, we then have to account for, well, how is it then someone like Abraham could be declared righteous in God's eyes? And so Paul lays this out in verse 5, saying that the one who, like Abraham, does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. And we need to understand that Paul was saying something rather radical here. Here's what he's saying. God, who we know to be perfectly holy, God, who always acts justly, this God is willing to justify the ungodly. How can he do that? On what basis can a holy God declare a sinner to be righteous? Well, verse 5 is telling us that a sinner who understands that his or her works could never secure God's favor, but one who instead trusts that God alone can justify the ungodly, that person's faith is credited as righteousness. And so then to illustrate this point and to help us get this concept across, Paul then, again, he turns back to the Old Testament. And he says, not only did Abraham believe this, not only did Abraham believe that God declares the sinner righteous who trusts in God's gracious gift, but guess what? King David believed it as well. Verses 7 to 8 here in Romans 4, Paul, what he does is he quotes from Psalm 32, which is a passage where David is rejoicing over the blessings of justification. He quotes it there, and he's saying that David declared these words, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. You see, from this psalm, we understand that David was someone who understood his own rebellious heart. He was confessing that he was a man who transgressed God's law. David couldn't deny that he was a sinner. He knew that nothing he could do could undo his unrighteous standing before God. But God could do something. You see, God could forgive every one of his transgressions. God could cover the guilt that it was incurred by all of David's sins. And by faith, David trusted that God's grace was so complete that the Lord would never count David's sin against him. 
You see, David believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so, too, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Friends, this morning, I want to ask, are you able to sing those words along with David, the the words of Psalm 32? Can you declare, I am blessed because I trust in Christ and not in myself? All of my transgressions are forgiven. And by faith in God's amazing grace, every one of my sins is covered. I know I could never do anything to remove my own guilt, but I believe that God has done so for me. And therefore, I know that the Lord will never count my sins against me. Do you believe that? Does that describe your faith? Because this is what David believed. It's what Abraham believed. And Paul's point there in verses 4 through 8 is that faith like Abraham's earns us nothing but gains us everything. Now at this point in the chapter, Paul anticipates that he needs to make an important clarification here. This idea of Father Abraham, well, who was Father Abraham the, the father of? At the end of the day, who are God's people? To whom does this promise of forgiveness and this promise of crediting of righteousness, who does it apply to? I want you to follow along with me again as we look down through Romans 4, 9 through 12. Paul writes, he says, Is this blessedness only for the circumcised, that is for the Jew, or also for the uncircumcised, for the Gentile? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that his right, or that righteousness might be credited to them. And... He is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but also who follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. What in the world is Paul saying there? In fact, all this talk of circumcised and uncircumcised and Jew and Gentile, you might be thinking, Paul, you're going on and on about this stuff again. Didn't we already deal with this back in chapter 2? Haven't we left this behind? What does this have to do with justification, being counted righteousness, righteous in God's eyes? Well, here's a simple answer. The best way to summarize that section, verses 9 to 12, is simply to say, with respect to Abraham's story that we listened to last Sunday, Genesis 15 came before Genesis 17. That's what he's saying in that passage. Genesis 15 came before Genesis 17. And you're thinking, yes, that's obviously how chapters work. But here's Paul's point. In Genesis 15, remember that story that God took Abraham on this sort of field trip outdoors, out to view the night sky. God took Abraham outside, and he said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said, so shall your offspring be. And here's that verse. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. See, that happened in Genesis 15, in this stage of Abraham's story. So when God made this promise to Abraham, God's command given to him to be circumcised 
as a, as a sign of the covenant was still 30 years down the road. Chapter 17 happened 30 years later. In other words, the events of Genesis 15 happened long before those of Genesis 17. And if that's the case, here's Paul's point, then the blessing of being counted righteous doesn't apply exclusively to those who, like Abraham, were circumcised, that is, just to the Jews. No, this hope of being declared righteous in God's eyes, it applies to all people who, like Abraham, like Father Abraham, placed their faith in God's justifying grace. You can't earn it. You can't do anything to receive it. Not even circumcision. Paul concludes then in the second half of verse 11, so then Abraham is the father of all who believe, but but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And, he, then, uh, and then he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. You see, faith like Abraham's is the defining feature of his family tree. Paul wanted his readers regardless of their ethnic background, to understand that this promise of faith in God credited to one as righteousness was not exclusive to Abraham's biological lineage. The promised blessing to Abraham, the blessing that David rejoiced over in verses 7 to 8, is a blessing guaranteed to all of Abraham's descendants, those who, like their spiritual forefather Abraham, trust in God's provision of justifying grace. I've referenced it a couple of times in this message, but I hope that you heard Pastor Jerry's message last Sunday that focused really on the middle of this chapter, Romans 4, 13 through 21. If you were not able to join us last Sunday... Uh, either here or online, I would encourage you to go back to to read or or listen to or watch that sermon. And and just as a reminder, you can always request a written transcript if you ever need one from the church office. You can hop on our website. You can find all this past audio, video, documents. But if you were with us, you'll remember from last Sunday that the faith of Father Abraham was, according to verse 17, that his faith was in the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. As I mentioned earlier, this middle section of the chapter, it could be summed up by saying that against all hope, Abraham demonstrated this unwavering faith in the power of God to fulfill all that he had promised. Paul goes on in verse 22 to say, this is why it was credited to Abraham as righteousness. But folks, we're not just spending two Sundays in Romans 4 just to stand back and to admire the amazing faith of this Old Testament hero. Look at what Paul says as he concludes this passage in verse 23. He says, The words, it was credited to him, were not written for him alone, but also for us. To whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So even though Abraham's story is an Old Testament story, and it's an old Old Testament story, You know, it's also a gospel story. You see, Abraham believed God. He believed that God can give life to the dead. 
He trusted in a God who justifies the ungodly. He believed that God would forgive his transgressions, cover his sins, declare him to be not guilty in God's sight. Not because of his works, but because of God's grace on his behalf. Folks, that's a gospel message. Faith like Abraham's is gospel faith. Now, Abraham, of course, lived a long time before Jesus' birth, his death, and his resurrection. However, the story of Abraham's faith is a story about gospel faith. Abraham's faith, the kind of faith that we too are called to have, a faith in the God who gives life to the dead. Gospel faith, you'll see according to verse 24, is faith in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. You see, we too are called to trust in the God who justifies the ungodly. The God who can take dead things, like spiritually dead men and women, and give them new life. We too must believe that God can forgive all of our transgressions, cover all of our sins, declare us to be not guilty in His sight, not because of our works, but because of God's grace on our behalf. You see, the purpose of last week's message and today's sermon is not to elevate Abraham's faith as as some kind of exemplary faith, something for us to maybe strive for? No. Abraham's story was recorded in Scripture to teach us simply that God justifies the ungodly. Those who by faith believe that God has done something to make sinners right with him. Those who trust in the saving work of Jesus Christ on their behalf can be, like their spiritual forefather Abraham, declared to be righteous in God's eyes. I invite you to pray with me. Father, as we think about this idea of justification again, it's a concept we need to keep coming back to. Because the temptation, Father, is, is for us to think that, that we need to earn your favor. That we need to do things to, to stay in your good graces. That, Lord, it's all about how we fix the problem. But none of that is true. And if it wasn't true for Abraham, it's not true for us. But what is true for Abraham and what is true for us is that you justify the ungodly. That you have saved us by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So Lord, I I thank you for your amazing grace. I pray that those of us here in this room or watching online who, who know this saving grace in Jesus Christ, that today that we would celebrate it. God, for those for whom that is not yet something they've known personally, I pray that this idea that you are the one who justify the ungodly, that you just let that sink in deeply this morning, that you would show it to those who need to hear that so desperately. Thank you for the good news of the gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name.